Do you have water intrusion issues? I do. So I jackhammered out this slab on grade to make sure it never happened again. If you want to learn why, stay tuned. If you've ever been in any type of a dwelling that has had water intrusion issues, you know how much of a headache it is. And on this house, I've had significant water intrusion issues for over a decade and I've tried numerous different solutions. In order to finally bring this problem to an end, I brought in the professionals, which is the very first time I've ever done this on my own home on this entire channel. But I figured I might as well spend the money to do it right the first time since this has been such a long ordeal that I've dealt with and haven't found a good solution for it. Luckily for me, I had a rock star team locally that would allow me to film the entire process. So if you want to do it yourself the correct way, you can. Or if you're in the Northwest Washington area and want professionally done, I highly recommend Rainy Day Basement Systems. Prior to them coming out, we did confirm where we wanted the sump pump to be placed in the garage. And before we jackhammered out anything, they did diligently make sure that no dust particles were going to find their way into the house. Once that is taken care of, we immediately start chipping up the old concrete in this small corner. This house was built in the 1950s and there's approximately four to five inches of concrete for this slab on grade. The problem is, is that there's no vapor barrier underneath the slab on grade, which they never really worried about back in those days. However, because this is a daylight basement, that means that when the water table rises to a certain level because of a large downpour, then water will seep through the concrete into my basement. And that is definitely not a fun situation. Doesn't happen all the time, but it happens often enough that I want to make sure that it never happens again. This is tedious physical work and the only real way to get into these small tight knit areas and get down to the depth that we need is a small shovel and buckets. Lots of buckets. With a shovel we're able to get down to a depth of approximately 20 inches, but once we get to 20 inches we run into a layer of clay, or at least some really hardy bedrock because we needed to take a hammer drill with a shovel bit, or in other terms a spade bit just to go another 4 to 6 inches deep. As you can see this soil is very dense and keep in mind that this is the daylight basement point, so the bottom of this pit is actually technically 7 feet below the elevation of my front yard. We took out a lot of material which added up to approximately two and a half garbage pails full and luckily for us the majority of what's being put back in the hole is going to be this river rock along with the sump basin. The basin itself is approximately 22 inches tall and once we have the correct depth of our hole we can start the installation process. A large filter sock is placed right over the basin in order to filter out any larger particles that could find their way into the basin and clog it over time. We pour in a couple inches of river rock at the very bottom and then place our basin right on top. Once in place, it's time to start filling our sleeve. Now the really unique thing about their installation process is that they actually recommend filling the inside of the sleeve as well as the outside of the sleeve with rock. This seems to be a more adequate way of filtering out particulates if you have it on both sides of the sock before it gets to your basin. As we fill our hole up with rock, we leave approximately two inches between the top of our basin to the top of the rock. And that's going to be there because we want to make sure that we have enough space for concrete afterwards. One thing Rainy Day did recommend installing was this water guard system around my entire family room. However, that means jackhammering out a small section of concrete around the entire perimeter of my finished family room and then I'd have to go back and repair it. In all honesty, that is something that I might do down the road if I still have water intrusion issues after the sump pump is installed. But I personally think that this is going to be plenty and we're just installing the entry point to this water guard system which will make that installation process much easier if we have to install that system at a later date. A waterproofed wax paper is actually applied around the entire perimeter of our basin just to make sure there's a nice divider between our concrete and the rock below it. As for concrete, we're using this sand mix by Sackcrete and there is Portland cement built into this system, it just doesn't have any large aggregate in the mix. They indicated that they do like this mix better because the small particles that can go into small tight knit crevices, which they obviously run into quite often because of the nature of where these sump pumps are normally placed. 
Once mixed properly, it's then transferred into buckets and then transferred to our sump pump area. As the mixture is being applied around the entire perimeter, it's agitated a bit with a stainless steel trowel, smoothed out, and then finished off with a magnesium trowel. Keep in mind that the sump pump basin is slightly recessed into the concrete. It's not at the same exact elevation of the existing concrete because we want the water to flow towards the sump pump and there's a really unique feature within this lid because the lid itself has this ball valve built into the bottom of the lid which means that water can go into this small valve and as the water rises, the ball rises and then the water can flow into the sump pump. That makes this system still airtight as they want it. But now that we have the basin set and installed, it's time for the pumps. I don't ever want water to get into my basement again and to prevent that, I have a double sump pump system. One is a third horsepower, the other one is a half horsepower. They're both Zoller pumps and this will also guarantee if we have an outage in electricity, we have a battery backup. So no matter what, we have water being pumped to the street even in an outage. Let's get them installed. There's a lot that goes into these pumps, so I figured in order to make sure we have as clear and concise of an explanation as possible, I asked my installer Daniel just to explain the general process of each pump. So we got your, your M53, it's your primary pump. You got your ultra sump, which is your battery backup pump. Um, M53 takes suction from the bottom. It's good for up to a half inch particles. Not recommended, but it's good for it. Um, take suction up through here. Got a stop valve here and a valve here or check valve. Um, keep backflow from happening. We'll pump up, up on out of the system. Um, you have your switch here. It's your high level switch for your ultra sump. If for whatever reason you're on battery power, then that's what's gonna be triggering the only pump that's working at that time. Otherwise, you got your float switch down here on your primary pump. You got your grommet here that just seals the lid for the airtight lid. It's gonna seal that up here. Put a Fernco in here for um, servicing purposes or having to replace anything like that. It just makes it easier instead of having to cut the system open and do a whole mending and gluing all that, everything back together. It's on a pump stand, keeps it from sucking um, silt and dirt and everything up from the bottom. Once this is in, it's set where I want it. It's locked into place and it's not going to move. There it is. So now that stand, it's got two little almost like little L brackets that stick off that catch the legs of that stand. Once the first sump pump is locked into place, it's time for the second. And as you can see, there's actually two bases attached on the bottom of this one because we want a tiered system. We only want one pump running at any given time, but if there's so much water coming into our basin that one pump can't keep up with the water, then there's a second larger sump pump that will kick on once the water gets to a certain height. The second pump is lowered and secured to the bottom cleats and then positioned with the grommet on top so again it is airtight. The cord organizer is aligned and the remaining lid is placed on top and we can move on to some piping. All the piping that's being used on the interior of the house is a inch and a half PVC pipe and any connection is going to receive a primer as well as a PVC adhesive on both the male and female ends. And on a side note, you know someone's been doing plumbing like this a long time if you never see them reach for a tape measure, ever, during this entire installation. Pretty impressive. Once the adhesive is applied, it dries in mere seconds, which means that you can go to the next piece, to the next fitting, and so forth very quickly and rapidly. I personally am going with a very robust system because I've had this headache for over a decade and to make sure that it never happens again, I want multiple layers of protection which this system definitely provides. And as always, if you're interested in any of these tools or materials seen in this video, I'll make sure I have a link for it in the description box below. But one thing I highly recommend anyone having, even if they have only one sump pump, is a battery backup because if there is a large storm and outage, all of a sudden you are stranded with no power to your sump pump and that means all that water is coming into your basement and that's not what I want. So installing this battery backup system is very key for most sump pump systems out there. Just keep in mind that we didn't hook up this battery till the entire plumbing system was fully installed. We didn't want this thing kicking on while we're trying to install the plumbing. 
As my install team installs the plumbing, I go outside and figure out the lay of the land for how we're gonna get this water outside. Originally, we were just going to pipe all this water directly to the street and then have it flow down to the sewer line. However, the one thing that I didn't want to have happen was have that moisture go back into my driveway, which Daniel did indicate would probably happen. In order to avoid that entire mess, we had to get a little creative with the plumbing and go across my garage, down the side of the house, and into my backyard. Luckily for me, I never installed any drywall on the ceiling, so this actually wasn't a large ask. Once I had all the insulation out of the way, they could proceed to installing their piping, and I can work on trenching out a 40 foot long hole into the backyard. The only problem with that is that I installed a concrete ledge at the perimeter of our gate in order to make it easier to slide. This one cement block certainly didn't want to come out, but with a few love taps thanks to my sledgehammer, along with a large masonry blade, I was able to get that one block out and move on to all the trenching in the backyard. In order to salvage the grass in a tidy fashion, I do just use a flathead shovel on one side and push that mound of grass to the opposite side. Once that is complete, I then use my trenching shovel and dig approximately 8 to 10 inches deep. This hole does have to be larger than you think because we're going to be placing a 3 inch PVC pipe at this location because we have the potential of two sump pumps running at the same time that are inch and a half pipes. As that's being done, we're drilling 2 inch diameter holes outside of the house to accommodate the two 1.5 inch pipes that are going to be coming through. As Daniel finishes up all the plumbing on the inside of the house, Juan and myself finish up the trenching outside because it is getting late. Well, to be honest, it's not really late. I do live in the Pacific Northwest, and it's 4 p.m. in December, which means it's going to be basically pitch black by 5. By the time we finish up the trench, Daniel has taken care of all the connections for our sump pump, and we tested it out, and as you can see, it works correctly. Hey! We got water! With the piping on the inside of the house fully taken care of, it's now time for the piping exteriorly. This pipe is a 3 inch PVC pipe that's going to be fully buried, but we have to get our plumbing still to that pipe. In order to do so, we silicone the hole properly while putting on these heavy duty sleeve gaskets so there's no chance of moisture penetrating my siding. Once we cut off any of the excess PVC, it's time for our ice guards. In warmer climates, you certainly don't need to worry about this, but in colder climates, you do need to make sure that we have an ice guard so we don't have drainage issues during the colder months. In terms of drainage issues, if you don't have an ice guard like this built into your system and the water in your pipe exteriorly does freeze, that means the sump pump is pushing water into ice, and that will lead to a much larger problem. But if you have this ice guard, the water will always have a way to flow exteriorly even if your buried pipe is fully frozen over. One other key element with the pipe that's buried is that you don't want it to be flowing uphill. You want to make sure that it's flowing downhill or at least level with the ground. That's of course if you have the ice guard built into your system. As noted earlier, this is when we hook up the battery backup and once that's taken care of, I double check all the lines to make sure that there's no leaks. But how do you make sure that there's no leaks if the sump pump's not working? Well, let's grab a hose. By placing a hose in the basin, it kicks on the sump pump, and as you can see, I'm watching it go down to the ice guard and travel towards the end of the yard. This might not look pretty, but this removed a tremendous amount of stress for myself, and that's what I consider one truly beautiful, sexy beast. Oh yeah, 